In the previous video, I showed how natural selection and mutation can work to cause deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We're going to uh, take a similar attack today in the video, but instead of those two evolutionary mechanisms, we're going to look at genetic drift and gene flow and how those can cause deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then also look at um, another factor, another assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is random mating. So we'll talk about how random mating can cause problems, can cause deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So genetic drift can influence uh, changes in allele frequencies um, over many generations, even in large populations. But if we're talking about a small population, uh, we can see pretty dramatic changes um, in allele frequencies due to genetic drift. And what genetic drift does is it reduces allelic diversity. But it doesn't do it in the same way that natural selection does it in a predictable manner. Remember, genetic drift, another term for it is random drift. So certain alleles will increase in frequency, others will decrease in frequency, and sometimes um, one allele will go to fixation, which means all other allelic combinations uh, will go to um, extinction. And again, the rate of, of this change from generation to generation depends on the population size. So you're going to see more radical um, uh, major changes in allele frequencies generation to generation when we're talking about small populations. So again, uh, that's more likely to be very apparent in small populations, but even in large populations, if there are no other evolutionary mechanisms operating, a genetic drift is going to still have the same effect of reducing allelic diversity. The generation to generation changes are going to be more subtle. So uh, here's a good example of this. Here's a simulation study in which we can random, we can um, produce different population sizes and start each simulation at an allele frequency of 50-50 A1 um, and A2. And what we can see is each of these lines represents a separate simulation. Sometimes the simulation increases the frequency of A1 to fixation. Other cases, the simulation, because of, again, random sampling in small populations, you end up seeing the extinction of the A1 allele. So this A1 allele either goes to fixation or to extinction. The speed at which it does this, however, is dependent on the population size. So that will be indicated by the jaggedness of the line from generation to generation, how radically we get changes from generation to generation. So with a population of four, it's going to happen really quickly. It doesn't take many generations before you get to either fixation or to extinction of the A1 allele. And so you can also measure that by the preservation of heterozygosity in a population. Start off with a population that uh, we have high heterozygosity, so um, we had a 50-50 ratio of A1, A2, uh, and we see it doesn't take very many generations until we completely lose that heterozygosity, again, meaning we see the fixation of one allele or the uh, extinction of that allele. Multiply the size of this population by an order of magnitude, we still get the same pattern. Right? Heterozygosity is decreasing, but it's decreasing much slower because the change, the jaggedness, generation to generation, is less extreme. And so it generally, this random walk, simulation after simulation, sometimes it goes to fixation, sometimes it goes to extinction again, but the time period that it takes to reach a fixation in the population one way or the other is going to take more generations. And then, again, uh, order of magnitude larger, 400, population size of 400. Um, drift is less apparent having an initial effect, but long term, we are still getting a reduction of heterozygosity. Okay, well that was computer simulations. What about real populations, or real organisms at least? So here's a laboratory study in which they took different populations of flies that had different frequencies of a BW75 allele. And that, that's a, an allele associated with eye color. So there's reddish eye color in different populations. So some of these populations started with a higher frequency of that. Some of them had very low frequency of that. 
And so you just follow generation after generation after subsampling a few individuals from each of these populations to establish the new population and you see what happens generation after generation and what you're seeing is movement of these allele frequencies so that some of the populations are getting fewer of these alleles. Some of the populations are getting more of these alleles until you start to get some of these populations become fixed for the allele or fixed for the extinction of that allele. And by the 19th generation, you have almost entire fixation of most of these populations. And again, if you just look at how that related to heterozygosity loss through time, we see this pattern ex uh, fitting fairly well the expectation. The expectation for the number of flies used in the study is this dotted line here. And we actually are much lower than that, losing heterozygosity faster. And that's because when you actually look at the mating behavior of these flies, while there may have been, say, 30 individuals in each vial in these populations, some of the males don't mate. So the effective population size was even smaller, which, as we would expect, would lead to a faster uh, change in heterozygosity, a, a, a faster loss of, of alleles uh, in these populations. And you may be thinking, well, maybe this had to do with natural selection. In some of these vials, maybe having red eyes was good, and some vials having not, not having the red eyes was good. Well, there's, there's no evidence of that. There's no selective reason why red eyes would be adaptive in one vial versus, uh, versus the other. So it's, it's a more logical explanation to say that this is due to a random fixation or loss of these alleles in different populations due to genetic drift. All right, let's put this in a natural setting. Genetic drift is a great concern for conservation biologists because populations exist across a landscape in a patchwork usually. So a single a species is not made up of just one population but multiple populations. So this is a collared lizard. Collared lizards are found in the Ozarks and they're restricted to these uh, glade habitats. These uh, high um, elevation rocky outcrops surrounded by forests. So they're little islands of habitats that become increasingly isolated due to the failure of fire to be introduced uh, um, like it was naturally in these habitats. So what this leads to is greater and greater isolation of good habitats. So it limits the ability of lizards to move back and forth between these habitats and it also ends up making very small populations with very few individuals in each one of these uh, remaining islands. And so what you end up having is each of these islands tends to get a fixation of a different allele. Very few of these populations are polymorphic with multiple alleles. And that's what's being indicated by the different colors in these uh, pie charts here. So again, the different alleles that are being fixed in each of these populations, they don't have any direct tie for any local adaptation in each of these habitats. They're simply being fixed by genetic drift due to being um, these populations being represented by small numbers of individuals with very little genetic connections, no real gene flow among individuals in these populations. Now, we're also going to see that in conservation biology, not only do we have problems with genetic drift and loss of genetic diversity when populations get small, but we also have problems with inbreeding. And we'll talk about uh, how that is also a concern later in this lecture. So with the loss of this genetic diversity, one of the big problems in conservation biology that is due to loss of, of uh, genetic diversity is a very high Ex localized extinction rate. So these, in, these individual populations uh, end up going extinct at a fairly high rate. The solution for this species, and actually many species that live in fire adapted uh, ecologies, is pre prescribed burning. Reintroducing fire into the landscape to modify the habitat to produce more glade habitat, reducing the extent of forests but also making greater connectivity between these glade habitats so that lizards can move back and forth, increasing the effective population size uh, through greater connectivity. 
And when you do this, you end up seeing that these populations get much uh, better uh, genetic uh, rescue with um, increased genetic diversity. This is true of plants as well. You, if you look at a population size and its relationship to polymorphism or um, how, how many uh, uh, gene loci are associated with multiple uh, alleles, you see that large populations are more polymorphic than small populations. Uh, allelic richness, basically the number of alleles per locus, that's also related to population size. You get more alleles per locus in, in large populations, fewer alleles, you get much greater fixation and complete lack of genetic diversity at each uh, allelic site or each genotypic site in small populations. So how does drift affect the operation of selection? Drift acting on small populations can actually hinder the ability for selection to lead to uh, adaptive phenotypes. So here we have an example uh, of flower beetle uh, color evolution in which the allele B plus is actually associated with a coloration that's actually adaptive in this population. And the overall trend in a population of 100 beetles is to see an increase in this beneficial allele. So we have directional selection here. That's the, this dark line is the mean um, increase generation after generation. These individual lines, though, are individual populations of these sizes. And you can see that in some cases, you may start off with a relatively high uh, frequency of this little, but then it just darts uh, south to uh, have much lower frequency a few generations later, and then it may recover. But there's a random walk around this mean propendency to increase in size. That's due to genetic drift. So genetic drift can alter the progress of natural selection in a population of 100. But what if we talk about a population of 10? Well, in some cases here, again, the, gen the general trend is the same as above. Natural selection is, is a predictable force that should increase the frequency of this B plus allele if it's adaptive in this situation, generation after generation. But genetic drift can cause the loss, generation after generation, sometimes of these uh, alleles because of random sampling error sometimes to the point that it actually goes to the extinction of the good allele. So it's actually, in this case, uh, working against the uh, evolution of this adaptive trait. In other cases, it, it actually leads to an increase in this beneficial trait faster. So the point here is that it can change the magnitude of the trajectory of how selection operates on a trait in a population. The smaller the population, the more likely you're to have some big time deviations from the um, selective forces generation after generation. And this leads to a big debate among some in biology. At the molecular level, what is the stronger force in molecular evolution? Is it natural selection, or is drift really more important for determining generation after generation change? So there are two general thoughts, schools of thought. The neutral theory, which suggests that advantageous mutations are so rare that most of the molecular evolution that you see, generation to generation, is driven by neutral mutations. Remember, most mutations are either detrimental or they're neutral. And so this is called the neutral theory. Selectionist theory says, yes, that's true. Advantageous mutations are rare, but they are common enough and important enough that when they occur, selection has a very strong impact on increasing the frequency of these beneficial alleles. Now, getting into the mathematics of the neutral theory is uh, beyond the scope of this class. Uh, I will just uh, tell you that it has allowed us to understand at the molecular level certain patterns that allow us to 
um, test ideas of the neutral theory and use it as basically the null model for molecular evolution. And when we see deviations from this null model, we can say things like, hey, there's a signal right there that's indicative that natural selection is occurring. So here we have an example of a primate phylogeny. And if you look at the, the pattern of evolution of this one gene, this exon of this one gene, you see that for the most of the evolution of most of these lineages, the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions, so non-synonymous substitutions are replacement substitutions. Synonymous substitutions are, are ones, so for example, like the third position. It usually, it is a mutation, but it's not going to have any evolutionary effect. Remember how common those are. So that ratio usually is going to be less than one if, if the neutral theory holds. When we see a high rate of non-synonymous replacement substitutions appearing relative to synonymous substitutions, that's actually indication that natural selection is occurring in those lineages. And so if we look here, we see the, the origin of this high rate of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions evolving first in the common ancestor of humans and chimps. And there's some suggestion that this allele is related to uh, greater uh, uh, brain size and brain complexity. All right, let's move on to talking about gene flow. How does gene flow impact deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Well, this really depends on the direction of gene flow and the relative sizes of the immigrant population. So if you, if you move from a small population to a large population, that's just a drop in the bucket. So really, I like to use the the analogy of if you have a, a big five gallon bucket of paint and you drop one uh, drop of red paint in there and mix it up, you mix it really well, you're probably not even gonna see any difference, right? I mean, there may be just a hint of pink at times, but once you get it fully mixed, it's just not gonna show up at all. Do the reverse though. If you take an individual from a large population and drop it into a small population, the relative magnitude of the introduction of those new alleles could make a difference. So again, you have a thimble full of, of white paint and you drop a single dot of, of bright red paint in that and you're going to change the color of that. So here's just a graphic representation of this. So if we have a population that at first is completely invariant, you only have one allele in the system, that's the only zygote you're going to produce, the only juveniles you're going to produce, but let's say that we have 200 individuals that are homozygous for another allele coming to the population. Now, what was just 800 individuals in this population, adding 200 to that, 20% of that population now is going to be represented by this new allele. And so that's a pretty quick change in the allele frequencies. However, this is probably going to be temporary because, remember, one of the uh, assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is that if you have one generation of random mating without subsequent introduction of new alleles or selection occurring, then the population will uh, achieve an equilibrium and, and stabilize there. And so uh, after one generation of random mating, if there isn't continual migration or, or new individuals being introduced, it should stabilize. And again, assuming there's no selection as well. Really, the effect of gene flow may be strongest in how it affects the next topic. Gene flow can introduce new alleles into a population and new individuals' uh, mating opportunities. It can significantly reduce inbreeding in small populations, and that, that's going to be a very important tool in conservation biology, as we'll see. So that leads us to our next topic, non-random mating. So I've tried to make the point that a lot of the violations associated with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are associated with the operation of the four key microevolutionary mechanisms. But then there's also the non-random mating assumption. And um, the reason I've make, discussed this uh, distinctly is non-random mating is not truly an evolutionary mechanism. It's a, it's a relatively fine distinction, but I think it's important to realize the difference between non-random mating and uh, natural selection, mutation, gene flow, and drift. 
Those others change, can change allele frequencies generation to generation. Non-random mating doesn't directly do that. What non-random mating does is it influences genotype frequencies. And then, obviously, in combination with the uh, evolutionary mechanisms, uh, it, that can change allele frequencies. But, but by itself, non-random mating uh, simply influences uh, patterns of uh, genotype frequencies uh, being expressed. So I'm going to focus here on one specific type of non-random mating called inbreeding. Inbreeding, what it does is it increases the frequency of homozygotes relative uh, to what would be expected from Hardy-Weinberg expectations. So if these are the, th the three possible genotypes associated with the two allele system, what we would see it, under the operation of inbreeding is a increase, an increase in the number of homozygous uh, AAs and the homozygous A1s and an underrepresentation compared to what would be expected under Hardy-Weinberg of the heterozygotes. So to better illustrate this, let's uh, look at the most extreme form of inbreeding, which is selfing. So in a selfing population that we start off with actually an overrepresentation of heterozygotes, so we have 500 individuals compared to each of the homozygous combinations of only 250 each. Remember what happens in inbreeding. If you're just mating basically with yourself, then the homozygotes are going to simply produce homozygotes just like themselves. The heterozygotes, on the other hand, are going to produce half heterozygotes and half of their offspring are going to be homozygotes of each type. So that means in the next generation you get a complete transfer of the 250 um, homozygotes of each type but then the heterozygotes are going to produce only half of the heterozygotes and then the other 250 of offspring that they produce are going to be evenly split between each of the two homozygote uh, types. So see what you can, what, what we're seeing here is a steady generation after generation decrease in heterozygotes and a steady increase in each of the homozygotes. So again that's just an extreme version of inbreeding when we talk about selfing but just inbreeding among close relatives has the same effect it's just slower. What you end up getting is an excess of homozygotes of each type and heterozygotes are underrepresented. So let's look at an example of this in nature. Sea otters off of the, the coast of California in the Pacific Northwest had a population uh, crash due to overtrapping. And uh, at one time there was less than 50 individuals in the California population. In the year 2000 this had been bumped up to about 1500 individuals. So in, in a small population like that we're going to see the operation of genetic drift but also, when you get to a small population, eventually everybody's related. You don't have any options of breeding with individuals uh, that don't share a lot of the same genes that you do. So there should be inbreeding. Do we see evidence of it? Well, if you look at this one locus, uh, examining th uh, 33 individuals, you see this ratio of uh, each of the alleles. So the, the S stands for slow, the uh, F stands for fast alleles if you run them out on electrophoretic gel. Um, but, but you see that there's a relatively high number of each type of homozygote and the heterozygotes have the lowest frequency. Alright, so if you say let's just test to see if this is in Hardy-Weinberg expectation, you can calculate the P's and the Q's associated with the S and the F uh, and then calculate the expected. Um, number of individuals and do the chi-square and you see that the chi-square is is highly um, different from um, the indicating that the expected uh, is very different from the observed. Um, the expected has a much higher ratio of heterozygotes expected than what we see and uh, the homozygotes that are observed are greatly overrepresented compared to what would be expected. So we are seeing fewer heterozygotes than expected in this population and so you may be thinking, well, maybe this allele, that's, that's because there's uh, disruptive selection and you, uh, both of the homozygotes of each type are, are selectively uh, advantageous in this environment. Um, well, there's really no, um, 
uh, evidence of that. And if you look at this same gene locus in the larger Alaskan population, you don't see this pattern either. So this is likely a consequence of inbreeding in a small population that's experienced um, a bottleneck event. So uh, inbreeding is not a good idea. And that's because there are some really um, bad genetic consequences associated with inbreeding. We call this inbreeding depression. Inbreeding depression is associated with a, a greater expression of deleterious recessive traits. So a deleterious recessive trait is one in which if you have the uh, allele associated with the dominant uh, allele, the dominant allele can produce whatever gene product is needed and so you don't show any abnormalities associated with the function of that, that protein. But a deleterious recessive trait means if you get the recessive, you get two copies of it, you probably, it's probably a knockout mutation or a nonsense mutation where you just can't make that protein or you can't make a protein that, that is functional and so you get some genetic abnormality. Um, so it's, it's only seen in the homozygous recessive individuals because just as long as you have one of the big A's, you're, you're covered, right? So you've got one of the, the, do, the dominant allele um, can protect you from the expression of this uh, negative trait. And as I mentioned, loss of function alleles are oftentimes recessive. Um, and if you're a heterozygote, you still have the one good allele, so you can still produce the, the needed protein, so you're good to go. Uh, you don't uh, show the, the trait associated with homozygous recessive individuals. But homozygous recessive individuals are going to show this, this problem. They can't produce any of the needed protein, and so they're going to have some problems for whatever the function of that protein was. So how does this relate to the topic we were talking about? Well, remember, inbreeding produces more homozygotes. Yes, half of those homozygotes are going to be homozygous dominant, and they're not going to have any problem, but the other half of those homozygotes are going to be increasing in frequency are homozygous recessives. And so you're going to produce more offspring with this problem phenotype if you are a heterozygous individual. Heterozygous individuals are carriers, right? So two heterozygotes mate they're fine. They don't have any problem associated with this trait. But two heterozygotes, if they mate, then they um, are one quarter of their offspring are likely to be homozygous recessive. So that's just basic Punnett square, right? Well, if you're heterozygous for that specific trait, who else is likely to be heterozygous for that trait? Well, any individual that's closely related to you, that by definition, genetically, they're very similar. And so that's why inbreeding is more likely to cause the, see the expression of these deleterious recessive traits for the same trait. So uh, don't marry your relatives, right? So we have laws against this. Uh, and there, there, re, there are actually genetic reasons and physiological um, results associated with this that tell us it's just not a good idea. Here is actually a study uh, in different populations in France where they looked at the mortality rate among children that were uh, unrelated parents versus those that were first cousins. And what you see is the mortality rate was always higher in populations, uh, in those same populations, if you compared inbred, children of inbred uh, relationships versus outbred, uh, they always suffered higher mortality rates. So, and again, this is likely due to um, an increased expression of deleterious recessive traits. Because two closely related individuals are likely to be carriers, heterozygous, for the same trait that could, that could uh, cause the expression of deleterious recessive trait in a homozygous recessive individual. This is a portrait of Charles Darwin because, ironically, uh, Charles Darwin, kind of the father of, of uh, un our understanding of evolution and, and uh, gave us many of our uh, uh, initial ideas of how evolution works, married his first cousin. Uh, but that was a, a very common thing uh, back then. So let's put this into the context of conservation biology. Um, one of the things that uh, conservation biologists oftentimes do is they bring uh, animals into captivity to increase um, the, the, the number of surviving individuals of that species. But if you are going to have a captive breeding um, a program or if you are operating a zoo, it's very important 
that you create some kind of artificial gene flow. So zoos oftentimes will ship sperm uh, from different individuals that are unrelated to the females in, in uh, one zoo so that uh, it prevents inbreeding. In natural populations, when you do see inbreeding, you see that there are negative consequences of that. This is a, a, a picture of a bird called a great tit. It's a European species similar to our uh, chickadees here and titmice. And on the x-axis, we have what's called the inbreeding coefficient. The inbreeding coefficient, the, the larger this number, it, it represents the, num the percentage of genes that two individuals share together, so the degree of inbreeding. And more inbred individuals had a greater number of eggs that failed to hatch. This is a really common thing in birds. When you see hatch failure, it's oftentimes associated with inbred populations. Outbred individuals didn't have this issue. This can also affect survival. So this is uh, data from uh, song sparrows, a North American species, and you see that the inbreeding coefficient down here, so again, these are really close related individuals, these are outbred individuals, um, in a, a really stressful year when weather conditions were really bad and food was, was limited, inbred individuals, uh, all of them uh, died. Um, quite a few individuals that are outbred died too, but all of the survivors were those that were uh, the, the least inbred, the most outbred individuals. So, so they probably had more genetic diversity and much less expression of these deleterious recessive traits. So I mentioned um, the the a common thing in birds that are inbred, inbred populations, is they have hatch failure, uh, have de decreasing hatch success rates. Um, and that is uh, true of greater prairie chickens. We talked about greater prairie chickens in a previous lecture in Illinois, how their populations have been reduced and spread out so that there's very little gene flow between these populations. Well, that those populations become increasingly small, become increasingly isolated, and so that means genetic drift has reduced their genetic diversity, uh, for one thing. But then the second thing is the remaining individuals become increasingly uh, sharing the same genes, and inbreeding is just uh, um, an end result that, that has to happen. So what we see is that in this one population, if you looked at the percentage of eggs hatched, it started really dropping. Um, and then in the uh, 1990s, uh, it dropped uh, again until you see hatch rates started going back up. The reason they went back up is because of a translocation project. Translocation is when you take individuals from one population and you move them into another population to reduce inbreeding. So you're, you're uh, allowing these captive, well, these isolated populations to have more mating options besides just close relatives. And uh, this type of genetic rescue where you, you're, you're suddenly increasing the genetic diversity of the population greatly, um, this mechanism, it's really artificial gene flow. The birds can't do the gene flow themselves. Their populations are too isolated. Uh, but if you can put them into a, if you capture some individuals from one population, put them in a truck, transport them to another location, you are doing the gene flow in that, that situation. We do this with red cockaded woodpeckers here in East Texas uh, and throughout the southeastern U.S. Red cockaded woodpecker populations are oftentimes very isolated from each other and there is some problems in some populations with uh, hatching success and so there's a translocation uh, project where uh, the Forest Service individuals will meet in different uh, areas talk about how their populations are doing and those populations that are doing well and have a, an excess number of individuals, um, that those are the individuals that you can then move um, uh, to a, a smaller population that's struggling. Inbreeding depression also happens in plants. I've been giving you animal examples, but the same thing can happen in plants. So here, in this case, looking at the y-axis we're looking at the coefficient of inbreeding depression so basically how bad is is inbreeding uh, the effect compared to outbred individuals so the higher this number the, the worse the problem is associated with inbreeding and we see that for some traits it's really bad in other traits it's not quite as bad um, but but um, outbred populations do do better in, in all cases 
Now, some of these are associated with uh, uh, just second year uh, traits. So um, the degree of inbreeding depression um, can hit different life history uh, stages uh, in, a, in a plant. And this can have uh, important implications associated with uh, forest production in plants. So here we have a uh, pine plantation in which you have uh, outcrossed uh, trees versus trees that were produced by selfing. And if you look at their uh, uh, DBH at the exact same age, you see that the DBH of, of the selfed inbred plants is significantly lower than those outcrossed. So this uh, has some practical implications if you're trying to grow trees uh, as quickly as possible so that you can harvest them for, for lumber and other wood products. So I hopefully I've convinced you right now that inbreeding is bad. I mean, there's some really negative consequences associated with inbreeding. And most sexually reproducing organisms do avoid inbreeding. So how do they do this? So uh, oftentimes it's associated with mate choice. If you can recognize your kin, if you have mechanisms of kin recognition, it allows you to not select those and, and do a better job of selecting an appropriate mate uh, that will have greater genetic consequences for your offspring. Now in vertebrates, there's some indication that um, mate choice can be influenced by major histocompatibility gene diversity. Uh, major histocompatibility genes are associated with your immune system and it, studies have shown that the more diverse your, your genetic uh, background is in the MHC genes, the better you are at fighting off infections, uh, you're, the stronger your immune system. So think about that. That means if, if, you mate, if you choose to mate with someone, you definitely don't want to mate with a close relative because they're likely to have the same MHC genes that you do. So your offspring are going to have less diversity. If you breed with an individual that's unrelated to you, they probably have very different alleles associated with each of the genes in the major histocompatibility gene complex. And so the offspring are going to have a more diverse uh, uh, set of genes associated with, with uh, those gene loci and, and be healthier. And so here uh, we have a, a, a study that looked at this among uh, humans. And if you looked at the heterozygotes and homozygotes in the observed and expected, we see that uh, you have an, uh, an, uh, uh, the observed frequency of heterozygotes is greater than the expected and the observed uh, homozygotes is less than expected. So uh, this is an indication that uh, we, we uh, are not seeing inbreeding. Remember, this is actually an indication of outbreeding. So, because inbreeding, remember, you have an increased representation of homozygotes and a decreased representation of heterozygotes. This is exactly the opposite, which is indicating that individuals are actively avoiding mating with relatives. So, what are the proximate mechanisms associated with this? How can you tell who a relative is and who, who might be an appropriate mate with regard to these MHC genes? Well, one mechanism could be just kin recognition. You recognize who you uh, uh, have grown up with and you avoid uh, mating with them. Um, but there's an indication that there are more subtle ways that we can pick an appropriate mate uh, to lead to more heterozygosity associated with uh, MHC genes in our offspring. There's a really interesting study both in mice, they started the study with mice, and then they continued it in humans, and I'll just talk about the human uh, trial where they took college students, and uh, uh, males and females, and the males, what they did is they said, okay, here's some just standard workout uh, shorts and, and a t-shirt, go get sweaty. Go for a run, go lift, just get, make sure that you get really, really sweaty. Um, then they took their clothing, the sweaty clothing that they had, put them in a plastic bag, gave them a number, right? They also took a blood sample from each individual and gave them the same number so that there's matching. Males were done at that point. The female's role in this study was to take a series of these bags, say 10, 20 bags, um, open them up, take a big whiff, and then rank them on basically their rankness. Uh, what, how did you describe the smell associated with those, those sweaty workout clothes? And they also took a blood sample from uh, the women. So 
what what the blood samples were for was so they could characterize the gene the genes the specific alleles at the genes associated with the major histocompatibility complex and what they found is that women that were sniffing the clothes of men that had really similar genes to them those clothes they said that's just disgusting oh that just smells horrible if, however, they were sniffing the clothes associated with an individual that had genes that were very different from theirs, they said, oh, this, this isn't too bad. And some actually described it as not, you know, kind of smelling pleasant. So this indicates that, that there are some olfactory cues that we can use to select uh, potential mates in an adaptive manner. And the researchers kind of went on and said, what are the implications for this in modern society? And they talked about um, how a lot of relationships don't work out and we don't appear to have a good record of choosing appropriate mates. And they point out that we have really good hygiene um, and that you know when we go on a date, uh, we do the exact opposite of being able to, to really sense our natural odor. So we put deodorant on and cologne and we bathe and... Um, I think they kind of went a little cr uh, over the top on this because most of us don't get married uh, or mate with someone uh, to have kids um, after the first date, right? Eventually, if you're with someone long enough, you're going to get a sense of what they smell like in their less than prime conditions. Um, so I, I still think that there's uh, the potential that we could use this um, as a way to uh, really judge the, the quality of your mate and, and, and how good of a match you are. So just pay attention to that. In plants, one of the things that uh, can help avoid inbreeding because plants can't necessarily choose who they mate with because, um, so if you're an angiosperm, then you're reliant on uh, pollinating insects to do that or pollinating birds to transfer pollen from one to another. So you can't really choose who you mate with. And if it's a gymnosperm, that's usually associated with wind, so you can't control the direction of wind, for example. So inbreeding avoidance in, in many plants is associated with molecular incompatibility. So 40% of angiosperms are self-incompatible. So if the pollen uh, from, from one of their flowers lands on the, the same flower, if it's, if it's got male and female parts, or if it's, if it's broken up into male and female flowers, if they do somehow meet with the same uh, individual, um, it, just won't initiate the, the growth of the pollen tube, so reproduction won't, won't occur. But just the way um, angiosperm plants are set up, um, that's another mechanism that can even prevent the need for molecular incompatibility. So uh, some plants are dioecious, so that means they have sexes on different plants. That immediately prevents inbreeding from occurring. Um, and even those that have both male and female flowers uh, on a plant that are monaceous can place those flowers in different locations uh, to reduce the chance that a pollinating insect will visit uh, the same type uh, on the same plant. They're more likely to maybe go to a neighboring plant. And in uh, flowers that have both male and female parts, there can also be the evolution of heterostyle, where you um, put the, the, the location of the anthers and, and the uh, uh, style uh, in different locations that, that reduces the chance that the uh, pollinating insect will uh, self, uh, cause self-fertilization. So here we see heterostyle in this one uh, species of plant, and you can see that some of the flowers have uh, the anthers way up here and others have the anthers way down here and it just uh, if if you're this kind of plant this bee is likely just to get pollen and not really visit uh, um, uh, here um, at the same time this uh, individual though is, is more likely just to, to deliver this before it goes down to maybe get some pollen for another plant so in animals, um, we oftentimes also see sex-specific dispersal different, uh, distances uh, from the area in which they were raised. And this prevents siblings from mating with each other. So in birds, uh, males tend to stay much closer to the area in which they were hatched. Females disperse much farther. And so this just reduces the chance that brothers and sisters 
when they become sexually mature, will cross paths. Mammals have a similar pattern with different dispersal differences uh, between the sexes, but it's just reversed. Males tend to disperse much farther away from the area they were born compared to females. But the consequence is the same, that, that siblings are just less likely to meet up and be potential mates in that circumstance. But as I mentioned, once you get into a small population, inbreeding is just inevitable. Um, eventually, everybody there's going to be a very small gene pool and everybody's going to be closely related. And so the combination of these small populations having inbreeding and then also genetic drift forces these populations through some pretty uh, nasty genetic bottlenecks that th they end up having greatly reduced genetic diversity and an increased representation of homozygotes and um, this oh, an overexpression of, of deleterious recessive traits. Um, and so you can actually end up fixing some of these deleterious alleles in these uh, small populations. The other side of that coin is sometimes with genetic drift operating and an increase, you're going to get an increase in either homozygotes of either type, uh, you might just completely eliminate some deleterious alleles. So you can either have an increase in fixation of these deleterious alleles or the elimination of them just by random, not by natural selection, but by uh, just uh, sampling error due to uh, genetic drift. So I have a picture of cheetahs here. There's indication that cheetahs, quite a while ago, before modern times, uh, went through a genetic bottleneck, and they uh, some of the deleterious traits that are, are expressed in cheetahs is very low sperm motility. Um, they have some issues with with uh, sperm production and, and production of uh, functional sperm. So that reduces fertility uh, in some of these populations. Some other examples, so the Florida panther is basically an isolated population of mountain lions um, and they've also experienced uh, inbreeding and genetic drift because of their small population and males in Florida panthers oftentimes just have a single testicle which clearly is not an adaptive strategy, it's uh, uh, the expression of a deleterious recessive uh, allele. So I've talked a lot about inbreeding depression. But it turns out that there's outbreeding depression as a possibility as well. If you end up having individuals breed that are adapted to different environments, this can disrupt what's called co-adapted gene complexes. So if you were born in one environment and you migrate to a population with a different environmental circumstances, if you mate with individuals in that population, you're, inter you're, you're passing on your genes into that population. That's what gene flow does. It's increasing the genetic variability in the population. But your offspring that you are going to produce by mating with an individual of this other population with other sets of genes may get kind of a mixed bag of genes that um, are not really appropriate for this, this new environment that you moved into. So it's kind of like if, if, if you're in... Uh, if you have the genes, which are a set of genes that are adapted to one environment, we call this a co-adapted gene complex, and then you mate with individual in another population that they have a separate set of co-adapted gene complexes that are adapted to a different environment, you mix those genes together and you're, you're, you're forming a, a hybrid individual that just really isn't a good fit in either of the parental uh, environments. So we call this outbreeding depression. So I mentioned uh, translocation efforts in red cockaded woodpeckers earlier. Red cockaded woodpeckers live in forests that are composed of different types of, of trees. I mean, it's always pine trees, mature pine trees is what they prefer. But some of these pine forests are associated with loblolly and shortleaf pines primarily, and others are associated with longleaf pines. And there are different characteristics associated with these habitats. And there's potential that if a population in a longleaf habitat has co-adapted gene complexes that are a good fit for that environment, and populations of birds that are living in shortleaf uh, loblolly uh, pine habitats have a different set of co-adapted genes. So when they're making translocation decisions, uh, they tend to, to try to make sure that you're only moving birds from longleaf to longleaf and shortleaf to shortleaf. Uh, to prevent this, this breakup, potential breakup of, of co-adapted gene complexes. 
So the previous lectures have examined evolution from almost a very simplistic single gene locus point of view. Next video is going to start uh, amping up the complexity of the examples that we give and talk about how different genes can interact and influence each other's evolution.